King Slime is a production of iHeart Podcasts and Heirloom Media. Good morning, Council's Interested Parties. We are on the record in the matter of State of Georgia versus Khalif Adams at Auburn 22 SC 183572. Let me go ahead and take roll at this point in time. It's um, April 19, 2023. Four and a half months into the YSL pretrial process. Jurors are being vetted and lawyers on both sides are making cases for what should be admissible as evidence. These are rather bureaucratic steps in the process. But I've been given a tip that something big might happen today. So I'm at the Fulton County Courthouse on Pryor Street in downtown Atlanta. All right, um, we're going to take a recess for lunch. I'll see you all back at 1.30, and we can kind of update accordingly at that point in time, okay? After an early afternoon recess, 13 defendants, more than a dozen defense attorneys, several sheriff's deputies, and a handful of reporters like me start to trickle back into the chambers, when suddenly the dull murmur of court preparing to resume is pierced by a blood-curdling scream. The scream comes from the courtroom holding cell connected to the chamber by a closed door. The scene quickly becomes chaotic. A bailiff orders people in the courtroom to take their seats as young thug wearing a COVID-19 face mask, a gray V-neck sweater with a red tie and a set of headphones lifts his gaze up from the desk in front of him and starts looking around. He's got a puzzled expression on his face. One of the YSL defendants, Christian Eppinger, rises in the back of the courtroom and starts protesting. Max Sharp, an attorney representing defendant Shannon Stillwell, urges Eppinger to calm down. Judge Earl Glanville's chair sits empty on the bench. But everyone else can hear more screams from the holding cell and more outbursts from the defendants. The bailiffs surround Eppinger and another defendant, Cordarius Dorsey, who also stands up in response to the screams. They are cuffed and arrested at their own trial. Then led through the same door leading to the holding cell where Rodelius Ryan, Lil Rod, is screaming. Proceedings are halted. And the courtroom is cleared. I find Rodelius Ryan's defense attorney, Angela DeWilliams, in the hallway amid the confusion. What the fuck was that? I mean, I don't even. My client was just screaming. In the vacuum of an explanation for Lil Ron's removal from court and his screams from the holding cell, tempers were running hot and theories were being formed in real time. They're doing that on purpose to show, oh, these people are bad, look what they're doing. They did it as a show. Yeah, but who the hell are they showing it for? Because... Like, to, to show that they're being disruptive. Our clients are not disruptive. You were in there. Nobody was being disruptive. No. Shannon Stillwell's defense attorney, Max Sharp, steps forward. I would just like to know if the press was called hours before the hearing to pre-plan I was one of our clients that being pulled out of the courthouse. I'm not blaming the press. No, no, I understand that. Oh, that. I'm, I'm, a member of the district attorney's staff said I should be in court today without being specific about it. So it sounds like the, the district attorney's office was planning something to have Miss D. Williams' client forcefully taken out of the courtroom in front of the press, and making all the deputies separating there. him from his right. attorney, who obviously cares very much about him and is in tears right now. And that's the way we're conducting this trial. That infuriates me, not because I'm his attorney, but because I am an attorney. And that's not the way we're supposed to be doing business. That's not how the justice system is supposed and to work. And they're not supposed to kick you all out of the court. Well, all we want is a fair trial. Can't be fair. I'm George Cheedy. And I'm Christina Lee. This is King Slime. The prosecution of Young Thug and YSL.
The first time I walked into Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis's offices was in May of 2021. It was months after she had been elected. And the first thing I noticed was that the hallways were stacked eye high with cardboard filing boxes. They were seriously everywhere. Each box had criminal cases in it. And those boxes were a little representation of how those cases were piling up. As if the space itself was slowly being swallowed by paperwork. But when we show up recently to interview Willis, her two and a half year effort to revamp the office is obvious. No boxes, no clutter. The floor is clear, aside from a giant white and blue circular rug with the scales of justice haloed by her name, Fani T. Willis, and the slogan, Integrity Matters. Willis has hired her own staff up and down the chain, promising a new order. And her PR team is composed of wired political operatives who walk us through these now empty hallways to a nondescript meeting room. Hey, how you doing? When D.A. Willis enters the room, she's tailed by a film crew capturing her every move. You know they're filming a documentary. Yes. Yes. We're going to film you filming. Oh, That's hello. <laughs> All right. Very meta. The district attorney in a major city is, by nature, a powerful position. But Willis's profile has risen much faster and higher because of a particular case that happens to fall in her jurisdiction. Let me ask you a question you probably can't answer. Are you going to indict Donald Trump? You know I'm not going to answer that. But you had to ask. I had to ask. Literally, as we were recording this episode, Fonnie Willis's office called me to tell me I had been subpoenaed to testify in front of the grand jury because I managed to discover the accused fake electors trying to do their thing at the state capitol in December of 2020. I guess she answered that question early for us anyway. Former President Donald Trump's, quote, perfect call to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger actually took place the day before Willis started her first term. Between the Trump fake electors indictment, the YSL and YFN trials, and all the everyday cases swirling around, it's a lot. How are you going to handle all of this stuff? Like, this just, it seems like a lot of moving parts right now. I mean, there are a lot of moving parts. I can't deny that. I have a very complex job that involves a lot of very complex issues. But I'm capable of handling those issues. We do them every day, one day at a time. I'm probably giving a little bit of too much of my life up to this. But this is my dream job. People look at me like I'm crazy. This was my dream. God plants different dreams in different people. And this was my dream. From this perch, I can impact so many things. It's important, the work that we're doing. So I guess I'm saying I like living a life that has meaning. Willis says she approaches the job simply by working her ass off. I was emailing people at one o'clock this morning. I slept from about one to five. You know, I got in a car to get to my first appointment. To me, it's worth it. I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm going to do it as long as I can do it. My plan was to spend this first term kind of correcting all the things that I thought went wrong. I hope to spend my next two terms really putting my mark on this and making sure that people know that the DA's office is here to serve you. Willis credits her father for instilling this tireless work ethic in her. I was raised by a criminal defense attorney. I think I've become my father in this sense. She is the daughter of a prominent civil rights attorney who was also a Black Panther. I tell my father that he had child abuse because he used to have me put together his files. And his files contained dead people. And I was like, you know, that's probably child abuse. Probably was not appropriate for an eight-year-old. Willis was born in Inglewood, California, attended Howard University, and stayed in Atlanta after getting her law degree at Emory, working for the district attorney's office as a prosecutor for nearly two decades. I left the district attorney's office to run for judge. Um, got 49% of the vote, right? Um, then got to a runoff and got 44% of the vote and lost. Uh, Really spent some time, because I went into my own retirement with money I didn't have, um, to try to make that a success. And and I had conversations with God to say, like, you know, what you doing? (laughs) Like, I did everything I knew how to do, and why didn't this work out for me? But I had sense enough to say, like, what is your plan? And I'm not going to tell you, like, I heard some voice because I didn't hear any voice. That's what was frustrating about it. But the very next day, people started calling me, will you represent me? I'm like, wait a minute. I'm exhausted. I haven't slept. I I haven't rebounded yet. 
Willis went into private practice, defending clients in criminal cases. That was an excellent experience because that had me in Georgia prisons, had me talking to defendants. It had me making sure that I advocated for people. I think that was part of God's plan. He needed me to have that experience before allowing me to be in this position. She then served as the chief judge of Georgia's Judicial Qualifications Commission, a group that oversees and prosecutes judges in the event of malfeasance. I'm one of the very few African-Americans that's ever had the chance to do that and hold judges accountable. And I'm very, very proud and very humbled that I was able to have that experience. In 2019, she became chief judge for South Fulton, a metro Atlanta city of 100,000 residents. And then again, I got to watch the criminal justice system from a different perch. It was in 2020 that she says she started getting calls to run for district attorney. And I'm thinking, I don't want to run for DA. I'm making a little bit of money right now. I got this cushy job as a judge. I go sit up here and they're paying me six figures to do it. Plus, I can take clients. Like, why would I want to do anything other than this right here? This is a good life. Um, but something nagged on me, mainly people, right, in the community saying, no, we, we really need you. We, we, we need you to come about at this time and to, and to do this. And all of those experiences were needed so that I would be equipped for this job. So the 18 years as a prosecutor, that wasn't enough. It was the needing to go into Georgia prisons to relate to criminal defendants, to help them. And, you know, when I'm an advocate for them, I'm, I'm as much as an advocate for my client as I am for the state. Back when Willis was campaigning to replace Paul Howard in 2020, violence was becoming an increasingly worrisome problem in Atlanta. 2020 will go down as a year violent crime ravaged Atlanta and other major cities across our country. Those homicides in Atlanta increased 62% year to year. We are shooting each other up on our streets. People all across the city are frustrated with all the crime, frightened of it, and demanding action to stop it. The media does a poor job of explaining crime to people. Most folks think crime has been rising for most of their lives because murder dominates newscasts and social media feeds. Atlanta homicides and aggravated assaults. Gunfire erupting. 31 people injured and at least five people killed. All violent crime. Spiking crime. In this wave of violence. I've never seen crime in every area of Atlanta like it is right now. Up through 2019, violent crime had been mostly falling across America for about 25 years, including Atlanta. And then it started rising. It was happening in most large cities, and Atlanta got the worst of it. Nationally, the homicide rate increased by about 30% in 2020. It was the biggest one-year increase in at least 100 years. Atlanta's homicide rate rose about twice as much, 59%. From 99 people killed in 2019 to 157 in 2020. Police nationwide tend to attribute the 2020 murder spike to something you may have heard of. We know in 2020 a lot of things happened from trails of the Ferguson effect, as they call it. That's Antonio Long, a deputy chief investigator with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. The Ferguson effect is a reference to the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, near St. Louis in 2014, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and the police response to that. Some of the things that happened with police brutality in 2020 during the pandemic that led to protests, some of the challenges with law enforcement in the communities, some of the stances on both sides of the aisle in terms of police presence and police activity, some of that may have caused police officers to respond differently for fear of retaliation or what may happen to them if they respond and depending on how they responded. So we know a lot of those things played part into some of the things that took place to increase crime. I started looking closely at why crime rose in Atlanta in 2021. In Atlanta, Policing problems definitely contributed. Dozens of Atlanta police officers calling out for a third straight day now. Cops here basically went on strike for a while after the former DA charged two officers with murder for shooting a DUI suspect, Rayshard Brooks, dead after fighting with him. The sick out or the so-called blue flu beginning right after the Fulton County DA said he was charging two officers in Rayshard Brooks' death. But violent crime started to curve upwards a few weeks before the protests began in Atlanta. Just as the pandemic lockdowns and associated job losses started to threaten people's livelihoods. 
Atlanta has an entrenched inequality problem that drives crime even in the best years. Mix that with the state's scant mental health resources and very loose gun laws, and the cocktail turns Molotov by the Rayshard Brooks protests and the blue flu sick out. But where others saw chaos, Willis saw a pattern. So when she became Fulton County's first female district attorney in 2020, gang violence became her top priority. I remember when we first took office, we're screaming from the top of the hills that there's a gang problem. And people were really actually kind of treating us like we were crazy, right? There's a gang problem in L.A. There's a gang problem in Chicago. But they did not want to admit that there was a gang problem right here in Atlanta. But we kept talking about facts that I knew to be true because I knew crime waves. I knew that one important person got killed and then we get a gang war for several years. In the YSL trial, that one important person is Donovan Thomas. We're finding that Donovan Thomas is super important. Peanut. Yeah. You had an interaction with his family early in your career, earlier in your career. Can you tell us about that? Because we have an ongoing case where I'm sure you're aware he is the center of that case. I won't speak to that. I will speak to this. The Internet is always very interesting. I have seen speculation where I have something more than a professional relationship with that family. That is not true. What you will find, though, is the ethics of my administration. What I insist on from everyone is that everyone is entitled to some dignity and value. And I bring that up because sometimes people that sometimes have made bad choices or have done the wrong thing or from certain zip codes, right, or let's just just hit it on its head. African Americans, impoverished, uneducated, aren't treated with the same level of respect and dignity. And so the interaction that I had with them or I'll have with any family, no matter where they come from, is always going to be the same. And that is that we're going to make sure that we treat people with respect. Willis has to be careful. She's become a high profile figure, not just in Atlanta, but nationwide. She's been profiled in scores of national media outlets and can deliver a hell of a soundbite. But the YSL indictment is an active case, and we were granted this interview with an understanding that D.A. Willis will not be able to directly discuss the YSL trial. But of course, we try anyway. As you know, I have an active case going on, so I'm going to um, not comment. I don't even know what case you're looking at. Now, you know I'm not going to comment on this, but I'm going to let you ask the whole question. Even if she can't get specific... There's still plenty to talk about. What we're most interested in is her office's broad approach to prosecuting gang violence and all of the complicated social, cultural, and economic issues swirling around those prosecutions. Coming back to this, like, the earlier press conferences where you're talking about gangs being responsible for 75 to 80 percent of violent crime in the city of Atlanta— I've made no secret about it, nor any apology, that as the district attorney of Fulton County, my number one focus is targeting gangs. And there's a reason for that. They are committing conservatively 75 to 80 percent of all of the violent crime that we are seeing within our community. And so they have to be rooted out of our community. How do you know it's 75 to 80 percent? I think the stats that we're depending on are actually low. What we are talking about when we tell those numbers are self-identifying um, people that have already gone into the penal system and they're identifying actually as gangs or we're finding their mail or their phone thing. So we're not hitting a lot of people. The one thing that is unique, though, about this group is it really doesn't count if you're in a gang if you don't claim it. Right. And so you will find and I, I know your background that even in police interviews, you've seen it where they'll tell you what's set there from. They are proud to declare it or they have a tattoo on that says it or they're claiming it through emojis or through direct language on social media. And so we're just talking about those that we know. As we've mentioned several times on this show, the YSL trial utilizes the state's Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, known as RICO, which means the defendants are tried together as a group and charges can be applied to everyone proven to be associated with that group. 
Willis's most famous win was in the RICO trial against several Atlanta school district teachers who were convicted of altering students' answers on standardized tests. So let me tell you why I like RICO as a prosecutor. What I have found is that jurors are extremely intelligent. They may be lay people. They may not be trained in the law, but they're intelligent. They, as your grandmama said, they got that just good old-fashioned common sense, right? What is so special about RICO to me and why it is a tool that I have made sure that my staff is trained on, that they know that it's there, is because it allows you to tell the entire story. So often when um, prosecutors are prosecuting a case, they are not able to tell the, the entire story. And it typically goes past this one incident. Let me give you an uh, example that's kind of off the gang world, but, but applies actually, sadly, in human trafficking. Oftentimes the police mis- will pick up a young lady, right, for prostitution, a misdemeanor. And if the police do not sit down and do a good investigation and a good interview of that young lady, what you often find when you just peel back just a little bit is that she's working for somebody. That's thing number one, right? And that not that she's working for somebody, but it's her and three friends or at least now what have become acquaintances working for them. And then what we found is if you peel back a little bit more, Gangs have really gotten into this, which is, 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 is in a diabolical way smart, right? You sell dope, you sell it one time, that's your profit, it's gone. But a woman, you can use her over and over and over again to keep that profit going. And so we see them branching off into that. Very quickly, that becomes a RICO, right? Because then what that money that they're making can tie into other things. Same person who is pimping those girls might have some young boys in the street robbing cars. And it's an organization that's doing it. And so why shouldn't we not use the tool to tell the entire story of all the harm that this organization is doing to our community? The Georgia Street Gang Terrorism and Prevention Act was first passed in 1992. But the original law was so vague that it was never used. As gang violence began to escalate in the state, however, lawmakers reformed the law. In 1998, a new law was passed that defined terms like criminal street gang and pattern of criminal activity. Penalties were increased for juveniles. Forfeiture of property rights were given to law enforcement and nuisance claims allowed officials to shut down businesses. Treble damages, which means settlements can be tripled, were also enacted when connected with gang crimes. And in 2023, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed laws that created mandatory minimum sentences of five years to a maximum of 25 years for anyone convicted of a gang crime. An additional 10 years are added for anyone convicted of recruiting minors into a gang. One of the men who helped write these laws works in Willis's office. RICO is a very flexible statute, and it can be used against any group that functions as a criminal enterprise. The Georgia Street Gang Terrorism and Prevention Act is a narrower version of RICO for gangs. Michael Carlson is the executive district attorney of the Major Crimes Unit for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. There is a, you know, been a federal racketeering laws on the books for, for decades. Of course, they sat essentially dormant for years before they started being used federally. And once they started being used for the purpose they were designed for, and that was to take down Cosa Nostra, essentially within less than two decades, Cosa Nostra was effectively ended in this country. Well, there's a similar pattern has existed with anti-gang laws and Georgia's in particular, and it can be done community by community. When arresting and charging and sentencing under anti-gang laws goes up, gang crime and recruiting in those areas tends to go down. And when gang arresting, indicting, and sentencing goes down, gang crime and recruiting tends to go up. And that's not only a Georgia phenomenon. Currently, state officials say there are 70,000 gang members statewide. Authorities have been pointing to that number for years. Here's acting district attorney of Cobb County, John Melvin, back in 2019. In this state, we have over 70,000 gang members. And in our prison systems, documented gang members exceed 13,000. That's almost not even a crisis. That's an occupation. I mean, we're literally being (coughs) occupied by a a, a foreign army. Carlson doesn't believe this talk is hyperbole. In fact, he prosecuted that case Melvin was talking about 
when he was an assistant DA in Cobb. Now just imagine for every one of those gang members, if they recruited one more gang member and committed one crime per month or per year, and then you see where we get the numbers from that about the size, scope, and magnitude of gang victimization and recruiting. I will note that there are about 50,000 people in Georgia's prisons today. And the head of the state's Gang Investigation Association says 15,000 of those inmates claim gang affiliations, often simply as a matter of survival. But look, there are about 10.6 million people who live in Georgia. Half are male, that's 5 million. About 25% of that 5 million are between the ages of 15 and 36. That's 1.3 million. More than 90% of gang members are men and boys in that age range. Gang cops want to argue that one out of 18 of those people are active gang members. And that's before accounting for poverty or location. Almost everyone in a gang is in the bottom 30% of the income distribution. Now you're down to one in six. I'm not buying that. I don't believe that number is accurate or even possible. I think it's inflated. Georgia's gang law requires prosecutors to prove three things. First, they have to prove that a group of people is a criminal street gang, as it is defined by the law. Prosecutors can use evidence of a common name, common identifying signs, symbols, tattoos, graffiti, clothes, or other distinguishing characteristics, common activities, common customs, common behaviors. But the most important part is that they have to prove they plan and commit crimes as a group. Christopher Sperry is Carlson's number two. He's the deputy district attorney in charge of the gang unit. Being a gang is not criminal until they start doing criminal gang activity. So those three individuals that may go ahead and be throwing up hand signs, wearing the same clothes, they could go out and commit an armed robbery. And that armed robbery is not yet gang activity because we haven't established that pattern or that history of the gang itself. We don't have to show that these individuals themselves committed that crime, but we do have to show that this is a criminal street gang. In the YSL case, the indictment describes the gang by its use of YSL as a symbol, flagging with green or red bandanas, the wipe your nose hand sign, which prosecutors say symbolizes killing someone, and the use of the word SLAT, an acronym for slime love all the time. But most of the indictment is about the crimes members are accused of committing to show that it's a criminal enterprise and not just a music label. Then, prosecutors have to prove that someone is a member of that gang. In this social media age, this couldn't be easier. I'll tell you right now, social media is without a doubt the best function for being able to establish association with a criminal street gang. The YSL indictment is peppered with references to Instagram and YouTube videos showing the defendants throwing up hand signs, carrying weapons, and making threats. Finally, prosecutors have to prove someone committed a crime to further the gang's interests. There's a set of crimes that qualify, which can be as trivial as graffiti and as serious as murder. One knock on gang prosecutions is that they're overbroad. Find three kids on a street corner, call them a criminal street gang, and lock them up for an extra five years for tagging the gas station. Carlson says that's not how Fulton County is trying to do business here. As law enforcement and prosecution's attention can get narrowed to a smaller group of people to wit, those who are committing gang violence, then that is able to allow us to then be more freed up for what would be more colloquially called criminal justice type reform measures for other offenders. And not to say that those would be, would not apply, you know, to gang members. Certainly they do. Certainly many people have been appropriately probated under our street gang prosecution laws. So I just wanted to make it clear that when that focus gets narrowed to gang crime and gang recruiting, we get those volumized and outsized results for public safety on the prosecution of, relatively speaking, very few people. Another knock is how it allows all kinds of evidence that could be considered prejudicial in standard cases. Normally, 
evidence of bad character isn't allowed because a jury isn't judging your character. It's judging whether you committed a crime. But gang cases can be a little different because prosecutors have to prove that you are in a gang, and the kind of evidence they need for that might also make someone look bad. A tattoo of a gun on your arm might not be admissible if it's just something you got to look cool. A tattoo of a teardrop under your eye in a gang case might be admissible if a prosecutor can show that the gang gets these tattoos whenever someone commits a murder. You know, you've got the fundamental rule of relevance that applies in court. It does this piece of evidence, whatever it is, make something more or less likely to have occurred in the case. You know, essentially that's the rule, something something material more or less likely to have occurred. And then, and then if the evidence is relevant, well, then it's presumptively admissible under another rule that we have unless the Constitution or, another, or, or a specific rule or statute keeps it out. So the onus is really on the people saying, well, this is bad, I don't want it in, which there's not a rule of evidence, quote, I don't like it. That doesn't fall under a Georgia or federal evidence statute. Ultimately, the DA's office offers one overarching argument for their methods. Sperry says it's that fewer people in Atlanta are getting killed. There is a reason why the homicide rate has plummeted. And George, I know that you have covered this. I believe the last time I saw on Sunday, we were 37% below where we were this time last year. And we also have to compare that to what are other cities at? Other cities were at 12.5%. So what is it that Atlanta is doing that we are three times reduced in relation to the homicides? And not only that, but when you actually look at what the homicides are, I don't see those interstate shootings that we saw in 2021 and 2022. The homicides are much more domestic than they are gang. And so why is that? Well, one, it's aggressive prosecution under the Gang Act. Number two, the police are actually investigating this from the outset as gang cases. They are trained in identifying and collaborating with our office and making sure that we are taking those gang warrants to begin with. So if any of those defendants are out on bond, it criminalizes or makes it a condition of their bond that they're not to continue to associate. You choke out the oxygen from the gang itself by making it so that way they can't continue to collaborate. But even D.A. Willis will attest to the fact that policing and prosecutions are not a long-term fix. We cannot arrest our way and we cannot prosecute our way out of the gang problem. That's going to fail. So what we have to do is make sure that we take as many children away from thinking that this is sexy and this is attractive and leading them down different paths. And so you have to have a double-edged sword. I hope that, you know, for gang members, I am hated and feared because I am not going to apologize for bringing gang warrants or educating the police on how to bring gang warrants and for prosecuting people that decide to get into that life. At the same time, it's important that we do activities that let children know this only leads you to a casket or a jail cell. That's it. That's not sexy. It's, that's not some place that you want to end up being. People do not enjoy that experience. And you have so much potential and there's so many other things that you can do. Two of the YSL defendants are already serving life sentences. One of them, facing a racketeering charge in the trial, is Rodelius Ryan. He was 15 years old when he and Damone Blaylock shot a man dead in a stolen blue Dodge Charger. Police say that just before 5 a.m., they got a call about shots fired here. The person they found shot dead was a 15-year-old boy. Khalif Adams, accused of trying to kill YFN Lucci in jail, is also serving a life sentence for a 2016 murder. The outcome of the YSL case will change little about that. Yet, their stories have become clear examples of how this sweeping indictment has created chaos downstream. Just two weeks into the trial, on January 19th, Adams slid a Percocet into Young Thug's hand. One of the defendants in the YSL trial is accused of passing drugs to Atlanta rapper Young Thug in the middle of the courtroom. Deputies caught the pass, searched him, and found more drugs. Young Thug wasn't charged, but the incident went viral on social media and set a tone for the months to come. It wasn't even a discreet handoff. It was just like, yo, my man, 
They, let's just slap me some skin and just clearly handed him something. If I needed a Percocet that bad, mm-hmm. I would just have to go all the way out with it. Mm-hmm. Don't pass it to me. Just kiss me and spit it in my mouth. Mm. Four days later, on January 23rd, Lil Rod and Sheriff's Deputy Morris Kandekai got into a brawl in the back of a patrol vehicle. While waiting to be transported from the jail to the courthouse, Ryan is accused of spitting on the floor of the van. And when told that he would have to clean it up, investigators say Ryan told them, I'm not cleaning it up, expletive. Kandekai's report says that Ryan spat in his face and then fought as he was being pulled from the police vehicle. But during the fight, Kandekai didn't activate his body camera as required. Lil Rod's attorney, Angela DeWilliams, filed a complaint, citing, quote, contusions on Lil Rod's body from being dragged from the patrol car to a nearby sidewalk. My client said he went, because he was upset about something, and they took that as him spitting. When they told him to get out the van, they just grabbed him before he had a chance by his legs, dragged him out, his head hit the van, and they dragged him out some more. He actually hit the sidewalk. Kanakai was suspended. He had been previously fired from a local police department for a similar violation in 2020. On January 31st, three YSL co-defendants were accused of knifing another person held at Fulton County Jail, DeMarcus Bussey. Those defendants are Damone Blaylock, Christian Eppinger, and Lil Rod. According to a report, a detention officer told Eppinger to get away from the other inmate, and he then pulled out a shank and stabbed the inmate in the chest. Fulton County Jail has had a massive security problem for years. And it's notorious for being overcrowded, dirty, and dangerous. Rappers, and most people, call it Rice Street. The sheriff has had a difficult time keeping drugs out and has confiscated wheelbarrows filled with prison shanks. A high yield of high-risk items, cell phones and homemade knives or shanks from the highest security floor in the Fulton County Jail. And those shanks are wielded by people with nothing left to lose but their lives. That is, unless they find another way out. The YSL trial started with 28 defendants in court. There are seven left. Two attorneys representing defendants Khalif Adams and Tanquarius Mender became pregnant. Those cases were separated from the YSL trial. Jaden Myrick who told the courts that he hadn't taken his psychiatric medication since last December, will not be standing trial after claiming, quote, Donald Trump is going to get me out. Damone Blaylock was also severed from the YSL trial after falling ill. Other defendants will not take the stand in efforts to save time during the overall trial. The district attorney's office says its process in gang cases is about finding the smallest number of people responsible for the biggest problems. Leaders get prison time, but underlings? They can get plea deals to help expedite the trial. Who gets a plea bargain and who doesn't? So my philosophy when I'm looking at plea recommendations is oftentimes the first thing I look at is, is this a juvenile? And I'm sorry, but, but you need to understand oftentimes we're dealing with children. I understand the horrendous crimes, but you also need to understand what their development is as well as, you know, do they have an opportunity to have that second chance? But when I'm looking also at deals, one of the things is not necessarily – always who pulled the trigger. Because oftentimes you can remove one of the people that pulls the trigger, and this still happens. Oftentimes you can remove the person who actually even pulled the trigger, and they'll find someone else to do it. If you remove that person from the actual incident, does the crime still happen? And that's really what I get at is, what is the culpability and the age of the defendants, and who can I remove from this equation? And this does not happen. One high-profile YSL defendant took a plea deal before the trial started. On December 14th, 2022, attorney Steve Sadow emailed journalists a press release on behalf of his client, defendant Sergio Kitchens, the rapper Gunna. What Gunna had done was enter an Alford plea. That means, while he acknowledges that the courts will likely find him guilty and that a guilty plea is the swiftest way to end his case, he maintains his innocence. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but was given one year of credit for time served and the rest of his sentence was suspended. In his press statement, Gunna was adamant about how prosecutors had mischaracterized YSL. It begins, quote, When I became affiliated with YSL in 2016, I did not consider it a gang, more like a group of people from Metro Atlanta who had common interests and artistic aspirations. My focus of YSL was entertainment, rap artists who wrote and performed music that exaggerated and glorified urban life in the Black community. 
end quote. Hours after his plea, Gunna left Fulton County Jail, pulling the hood of his black sweatshirt over his face. The Atlanta-born rapper, Gunna, whose given name is Sergio Kitchens, made a deal with prosecutors and walked out of the Fulton County Jail. Late but then the next day, music fans found footage from when Gunna was last in court. The footage is shot from the court's gallery and shows Gunna in jail scrubs, drab and green, sitting next to his attorneys. I became affiliated with YSL around 2016. Is that true as it pertains to you, Mr. Kitchens? Yes, ma'am. YSL is a music label and a game. And you have personal knowledge that members or associates of YSL have committed crimes in furtherance of the game. Yes, ma'am. You were present when law enforcement officers stopped the vehicle in which you were present along with Jeffrey Williams, wherein hydrocodone, methamphetamines, and a firearm were recovered. These items did not belong to you. Yes, ma'am. And do you acknowledge the following statement? I recognize, accept, and deeply regret that my talent and music indirectly furthered YSL the game to the detriment of my community. YSL as a game must end. Is that your statement or acknowledgement? Yes. These negotiations for a plea deal cannot be used against the remaining defendants of the YSL trial. Sado has also tried his best to remind the public that, technically, Gunna still hasn't cooperated with law enforcement. Gunna made it clear in a public statement released by his attorney that his deal with prosecutors does not require him to be a prosecution witness against the others. But because Gunna operates in a music genre that thrives off this idea of street credibility, no matter how connected those artists might actually be to that code, his fellow artists interpreted these negotiations plainly as snitching offering incriminating evidence to police so he could walk out of Fulton County Jail, dinging his own credibility. Willis says that this standard could not be more disconnected from reality. Sometimes we will take a plea just to wrap up that case, to give responsibility and closure for whatever that situation is, and there's no testimony required. In other cases, it becomes a vital part of proving a co-defendant up, and we do get pleas. But it's so interesting you talk about snitching. Because everybody hard, right, till they sitting in that seat. And so I've been doing this, I already said, a very, very long time. I personally have tried, you know, over 100 homicides, prosecuted hundreds of them because of pleas and other resolutions for cases. Literally all I did for a very, very long time. When people get to sitting in that seat, more often than not, they snitching. Because the choice is life or you can tell what someone else did and what their involvement was. And so that's real cool to say when you on social media, but when it's you sitting in there and your mama and your woman and you got a baby on the way, you have all these other responsibilities as a man you need to tend to, you got to make grown folk decisions for you and your family. And so often the decision is, I'm going to tell the truth and wrap this up for me. People had already been wondering, where was Kenneth Copeland? Lil Woody, who was targeted for a robbery at Club Crucial in 2015, why wasn't he indicted with the 28 defendants? After all, that robbery is, according to police and Chuck C., the first domino to fall in this gang war. Then court paperwork made its way to the internet. Woody had been talking to cops about gang crimes. A few months after Gunna left Rice Street, a three-and-a-half-hour video of a police interrogation lead to YouTube. The video is shot from a surveillance camera. In the tape, a man in a white T-shirt, tan cap, and distressed cargo jeans sits in a black and orange chair in a small, gray room. He's cuffed around the ankles right above his Timberlands. That man is Kenneth Copeland, a.k.a. Lil Woody. The video has a date burned in. October 27. 2021, a woman with long hair, wearing all black, sits across from Woody at the table. Her name is Marissa Viverito. She's a gang unit investigator with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Okay, here's a concern. You don't, you have a lawyer, so we gotta make sure. I don't wanna violate any of your rights. I don't wanna do anything. Listen to me. Mr. Melnick's still your attorney, right? Uh, 
I'm going to leave my turn right now. Okay. It's clear Viverito and Woody have known each other for some time. If it's not trust, there's at the very least rapport between them. Woody has just been brought in on a gun charge. He and an associate were pulled over for swerving. Police found a weapon in Woody's car and ammo in his pocket, neither of which he's allowed to possess since he's been convicted of a federal gun felony. Viverito tells Woody he's likely headed back to jail. The attorney on the case is going to move to revoke your bond. But there may be some ways to help him. She's got to have a conversation with some folks to see what she can find out. Please give me one second. I want to come right back, I promise. All right. For nearly 40 minutes, Lil Woody waits alone in the room. His only company is a green plastic cup of water. He mostly just sits there with his arms crossed, occasionally puts his head on the table. And at one point, he stands to look out the small rectangular window in the door. Yo! Though his leg is pulled back toward the table by the cuffs. Yo! By the time Viverito returns to the room with another officer, Woody has his arms tucked into his t-shirt, trying to warm up, trying to calm down. This is one of my partners, Investigator Flores. He works at Atlanta Police Department. I gotta tell you, he's the first thing first. Get it right to ring silent. Flores has cop muscles showing through a tight gray t-shirt. His black cap is on backwards. He sits down next to Viverito. It's clear right away that these two cops aren't just interested in why Woody had a gun on him. You had ammunition in your pocket. That's a federal charge. Right. So what I'm saying is... The federal time doesn't state. Right. But well, listen to me. That's what you're looking at today. We can, I can, cannot make it clear. We cannot offer you anything. If you want to tell us stuff, I, I can, we can communicate it to other people, but we cannot do anything. Viverito and Flores really want to know what Woody's friends are up to. Friends who, by this point, law enforcement has been watching and gathering information on for nearly a decade. Friends who, like Woody, are associated with YSO. But he's not going to give up that info unless he's promised he won't go to jail. And he implies he's been burned before. Well, you want me to tell you your name and then I'm going to go ahead to jail and do my time like, like did, I always do? Did, you don't always do your time. Did you did you go to jail for the nut incident? No. Did you go to jail for peanuts murder? I have to do it. Okay, so what I'm saying is... You, it made it make sense because my lawyer told me that they talked about indicting me on my, I even to die so I have no knowledge of it. I didn't know anything about it that. It's hard to make out, but Woody is insisting he had nothing to do with Donovan Thomas's death. But Woody does say he's sitting on some valuable and timely intel. He claims he knows of a hit that's going to happen. I know people are going to go do it. I can get it time when they're going to go do it. So y'all can get them in the head. Who's the target? Who I guess? I mean, Luchi's locked up. Sure, okay. So how? Who? Kel. Shell Kel is Kelvin Watts, the alleged Inglewood family associate who robbed Woody at Club Crucial way back in 2015. That first domino. Who? Kel. Who's always been tight? Shell Kel. And who? He's 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 this man. He's obsessed with this guy. He won't. He's mad. He's obsessed with him. He wants them, is what he says there. This is just as much as I can say. Because y'all got to retain them. Wait, you're, you're like, I'm going to get lost. You said, who, who's tight with the show? Woody looks over at the wall. He knows the guy he was arrested with is in the next room over. No, your friend's not here. Nobody can hear you. Like, your friend's not here. We moved him from yeah, The person y'all just think that I did tell you anything. He won't shut him. He won't have his bed. So you're talking about Jeffrey. Lil Woody nods. Why? Woody is saying that Jeffrey, young thug, is targeting Shell Kell. Shell Kell and Woody are sworn enemies. When this interview takes place, they've been battling back and forth on Instagram, trading barbs and threats. When Viverito and Flores tell Woody the info isn't enough, he offers more. Every single person they're looking for. And how much? How much 
Who did Jeffrey die? I'm not saying the life of him. Viverito and Flores aren't moved. What he makes another offer? To call someone with the officers listening in. One thing I do know, I do know you can call somebody on their phone and they hear what I have to say and you, I can call this person right here in y'all's face with a better background and let y'all hear and see his face tell me how they plan on doing this. Or call who? The person who I'm talking about. I care for him and I hate I'm doing it to him, but... Who? I don't think I'm not going to say You know somebody who I, I don't know. This somebody who's close to me. Is it young Thug? I didn't say no name. Eventually, Viverito presses Woody on his relationship with Young Thug and why he can't seem to get himself out of the cycle of crime and violence alleged to be tied to YSL. Have I had a talk about him ruining your life, Woody? Have I had this talk about him ruining what? your life? What good has he brought to your life besides that money? That's why he, he better did. Well, he has ruined your life. He's ruined Shannon's life. He's ruined Dee's life. Pretty much. Everybody he touches goes to prison, and then he gets new people. Y'all are replaceable. Y'all are disposable. Make no mistake about that. Because once y'all are in prison, he started you grouping. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Listen to me. Listen to me. You can't talk to somebody that can help me out. But they're, they're going to want more information than this. Say again? They're going to want more information than this. Okay, and I will. But I, what I'm saying is, it doesn't work. But like, y'all ain't going to leave me out here like they did. Like they did. Have I ever left you out here? No, I'm telling you. Have I ever left you out here? I didn't say that. I would say this much shit. What did I tell you? Did I, I not tell you that if something happens to you, I'm going to be upset? You're not listening to me. I'm listening to you. You think I'd be talking to you if I, I, if I had that. an issue? But, an issue. but what I'm saying is, I have never left you out here. You're not I, listening. When you told me... When you told when we met with Detective Kimberly Underwood at the Atlanta Police Gang Unit, Viverito was with her. You heard from Underwood in the last episode. So I, I'm going to ask this, and you can tell me to go to hell if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> the little Woody tape. Like, you're, I know. I just want to know. First things first. How, I got a drink on that one. Yeah. How, how, <laughs> how irritated were you when that came out? Irritated because it's... You're putting real people in danger, and I don't think it's fair to anybody. Or, um, I mean, and that's a classic. What happened with that is a classic hallmark of gang activity. I think Kim will agree with me. It's witness intimidation um, yeah. at its finest, and it's unfortunate. Witness intimidation in the sense that whoever leaked that mm -hmm. was attempting to intimidate Kenneth Copeland. Yes. Right, whoever it may be. The court and the district attorney's office began an investigation into the leak. They locked down the server that held their evidence. But no one has been held accountable for what happened. One defense attorney pushed for a mistrial. Snippets of the interrogation tape have been reposted online, with titles saying that Lil Woody was, you guessed it, snitching. Viverito had been talking with Lil Woody for years, including the days following Donovan Thomas's murder. And she understands how folks seeing that rapport could put lives like Woody's in jeopardy. So I was watching the tape. I mean, you're talking about talking to people like a real human being, like regular. And that's the thing that came across as I was watching the tape was that you had built a relationship with Kenneth Copeland over time. And I think that's something that I think people don't fundamentally understand is that, like, there are relationships between the police and people who are under investigation. Like, how normal is that? I came initially from a probation and parole background, and your goal in that situation is to basically help repair a person's life after they get in some kind of trouble and reduce recidivism. Um, and I had a caseload of all gang members, the worst of the worst. So, I mean, regardless of what somebody did, if they, if they want to do right and they want to have a second chance, it's your job to make sure that they have it. Woody was charged for the gun that day, but before he was led away in handcuffs, a sheriff's officer paid him a visit in that little gray room. Woody did the same song and dance, claiming he could provide valuable information if they could get him out of jail. As we mentioned earlier, Fulton County Jail is a dangerous place. Remember the wheelbarrows full of shanks? The sheriff's officer says this. I don't go through their normal chain of command. I'm, you can say I'm special in that sense. And, and, this is, and, and I understand entirely where you're coming from, dude, because you know what? I do truly believe that stuff is going on there. I'm not doubting that. He's referring to the dangers in the jail. And I don't want you to get all fucked up because of something like that. That's the last thing I want to do. If you're willing to help out with something like that, I would certainly not put your life in danger with that. So I, I understand entirely where you're coming from with that. So if it is something where I make up some ruse 
that get you out of the cell somewhere, and they don't know where you're going to go. I'm just saying, I can do that. Seven months after this tape was recorded, Young Thug was arrested. The 88-page indictment was handed up, and Lil Woody wasn't in the list of defendants. He isn't in jail or prison either. The state dropped its charges before Young Thug's arrest. There's one more thing in the tape that struck us from about halfway into the interrogation. Marissa Viverito gets frank with Woody, and Woody responds in kind. They don't care. He doesn't care anything about you. We've had this talk a hundred times. He doesn't care about you. Yeah, I care about him. How many times are you going to keep, like, getting... Scraping by and just dodging bullets. You you gotta stop at some point. Remember how I said in episode one that Young Thug must have known the police were coming because even I knew they were coming? Well, me and this one guy, Mm -hmm. I go around the door. I hear him talk stupid. I tell you, I said, they're gonna get you. You said what? I told him they're gonna get you. Who, Thug? Yeah, I told him. Like the police? Yeah, I said, the police gonna get you. I said, I said, you know, they're going to get you. And what does he say? He's like, I don't know. So you don't care? No, you don't. She read it. Flo Woody is to be believed. Young Thug did. He just didn't care. Next time on King Slime. We meet the defense attorneys who say the scales of justice are being tipped. They keep saying, well, we don't have gangs like Chicago. We have, they're different here. Well, yeah, because they're not gangs. They're just a group of kids. Are there people that claim YSL or that are from that neighborhood that have committed a crime before? Yes. But YSL as as a whole is not a gang. And that's the problem that the DAs, they know that, but they don't care about that. Go inside the holding cell to find out why Lil Rod was screaming. Stop. Unexpectedly find ourselves part of the proceedings. But I was told, and there's witnesses here, that they were alerted to come to your honorable court today because there was going to be something newsworthy. This immediate was called allegedly by, now I'm not saying any of these prosecutors, but by somebody with their office. And if that really happened, that's outrageous. King Slime is a production of iHeart Podcasts and Heirloom Media. It's written and produced by George Chidi, Christina Lee, and Tommy Andres. Mixing, sound design, and original music by Evan Tyre and Taylor Shacoin. The executive producer and editor is Tommy Andres. Fact-checking by Kaylin Lynch. Our theme music is by Dunn Deal. Special thanks to the Atlanta News outlets 11 Alive, WSB-TV, Atlanta News First, and Fox 5. And Carl Cadle and Noemi Griffin. For more shows from iHeart Podcasts, visit the iHeart Radio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.